Before I begin my homily this morning, this afternoon, I just want to acknowledge two sources that were particularly helpful to me in preparing today. I had a conversation with a friend and colleague, David Harrison, as we talked about our Good Friday sermons. That was a big influence to me in uh, today's sermon, as well as a piece written by writer N.T. Wright called Broken Signposts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. There is one concern that I hear over and over and over again in pastoral conversations with a whole variety of people. And that concern is about forgiveness, namely how to be able to forgive somebody when they have truly wronged us, when we're still living with the scars, with the hurt, with the very real anger about what has happened to us, how do we find within ourselves the capacity to forgive? We know as Christians that we're supposed to, and we also know how poisonous that anger and resentment can be to keep carrying around. We want to be able to let go of that anger and resentment. And sometimes we just don't know how. I can tell you that I've been there. I can tell you that I have carried around that weight of resentment as if it's a 10-ton truck sitting on my shoulders. And... I have felt stuck at times, unsure of how to unearth myself from the weight of that pain and hurt. There is a truth that I see in this consistent concern that people bring to me in these pastoral conversations. And the truth is this. As Christians, we are really interested in what it is to live good and faithful lives. And it's right and good that that is our concern, that we look to Jesus as a model and we try to follow in his footsteps. We we try to heed that call to be participants in God's generosity and beauty and life and goodness and love. That is good that we try to be good. But there's also a limit to what we as human beings can do. There are some things that just our own willpower or just our own strength of character or just our own desire for goodness isn't going to fix. Whether we're talking about those pains that we want to forgive, whether we're talking about the hurts that we have caused the brokenness that we want to try and mend, whether we're talking about grief that threatens to overwhelm us, whether we're talking about the realities of sickness or chronic pain that somehow we need to learn to live with, whether we're talking about death, our own death or the death of somebody that we love, There are these points in our lives and in our experience where we are going to come up against the limit of what we ourselves can do, what I myself can do. There are some things that I just can't fix, that we just can't fix. When we come to that limit, 
when we come to that place of all of the things that we as human beings, as mortal, fragile creatures can't fix, then we also come to our Good Friday story. Now this past Sunday, I talked in my sermon about the unbridled hope that Jesus' followers felt as Jesus came into Jerusalem for the time of Passover. We see his followers just throw caution to the wind and they proclaim him as their king. They are convinced that they have backed the right horse that Jesus is going to lead this movement and they are going to ride his coattails into Jerusalem and together they are going to make things right. They believe that Jesus is going to be that king that is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. He's coming to Jerusalem to actually overthrow Rome and restore the kingdom of Israel. And yet six short days later, all of their dreams, all of their hopes, all that they thought was going to be made right with this movement, it's all in shambles. It's all fallen to pieces and their beloved leader has been arrested whipped and stripped, tortured and executed as a criminal of the state. The history books have wondered for 2,000 years why it was that Judas turned Jesus in. And it might be as simple as Judas realizing before everybody else that the tide had changed and he switched sides. Peter is the one in this story who we lift up as the one who denies Jesus, who lies in order to save his own skin. But Peter was no doubt one of dozens, if not hundreds of Jesus' followers who said what they had to say in that moment in order to avoid meeting the same end as Jesus. No, I don't know him, they say. And Jesus' followers aren't the only ones who come up against their own limitations and brokenness in this passion narrative. The religious leaders have been trying to sort out the problem of Jesus. They've been trying to leverage what little power and authority that they have within all of the hierarchy of Rome in order to silence Jesus, to get him to put up and shut up and go away. And they can't do it. We see them become more and more desperate through the entire week until they do the unthinkable. They turn one of their own over to the powers of Rome to be executed in the most horrifying way possible. And here on this Friday, we meet Pontius Pilate, who to this point in the story has just been a footnote. And Pontius Pilate, in this moment, seems to hold all the cards of everybody in this story. He seems to have the most power, and he doesn't have any power either. His back is also against the wall. He doesn't want to put Jesus to death. Now, let's be clear. Pontius Pilate was not known for his compassionate leadership, and even he doesn't want to put Jesus to death. He sees him as maybe delusional, but just a nuisance peasant from the backwaters of Galilee. And he also has to follow through on getting rid of somebody who challenges Caesar. 
there's this final interaction between Pontius Pilate and Jesus, and it always punches me in the gut when we get to this point. Pontius Pilate, and I'm paraphrasing here, Pontius Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know that your life is in my hands? And Jesus says it isn't. Your power isn't real. You have no power except what comes from above. In that moment, Jesus pierces through the chinks in Pilate's significant armor and lays bare Pilate's ultimate vulnerability. And in that moment, Jesus pierces through the chinks in my armor and lays bare my ultimate vulnerability. On this Good Friday worship, we come empty-handed. Whether we are together in person or whether we're together online, we come empty-handed to this Good Friday worship. We don't take an offering in this worship. We don't bring our gifts forward and ask that they be lifted up for God's blessing. We come with nothing to this Good Friday worship. And yet our worship today is not about despair. It is about honesty and it is about hope. There's an expression that we use, and maybe you've heard it. The expression is, nail it to the cross. It's this visualization that we are offered as people of faith to take all of those broken pieces of our lives that we ourselves do not know how to fix, those places of ultimate vulnerability, that frontier of our own limitations, we are invited to visualize taking it all and nailing it to the cross of Jesus, surrendering it, opening our hands and relinquishing all that we can't do, all that we can't fix, all that we can't solve. When Jesus is lifted up on that cross, we understand that our brokenness and our limitations are lifted up with him. And there is freedom in that honesty of revealing all that we can't do and can't fix and must surrender. But there is also hope in that honesty. This past Wednesday, Reverend Alan McLean was our preacher at our Advent Cafe worship service. And although in this week we are spending a lot of time looking at the final chapters in the Gospel according to John, on Wednesday night, what Alan invited us to do was go back to the first chapter in the gospel according to John. Because there's a promise made to us in that first chapter about who Jesus is. Jesus, we are told, is the light who comes into the world and the darkness does not overcome it. Jesus is the word made flesh who dwells among us. The creator of the universe, the creative power of the universe comes close to us and dwells among us. The rubber meets the road on that promise on this Good Friday because the promise isn't 
that when we sort ourselves out, when we are good enough, when we solve some of these problems, when we get things right, then the light of the world will come into our lives. Then the word will become flesh and dwell among us. No, the promise is right here, right now. In all of the shattered pieces of our lives, in all of the broken places of our lives, God meets us right here. As Jesus is lifted up on the cross, our human brokenness and limitations are lifted up. And the God who created the universe in love meets us in that brokenness. As N.T. Wright says in that peace broken signposts, the darkness of our journeys brings us always and finally to the foot of the cross to meet the God who meets us right here. And the God who meets us right here picks up that work when there's nothing else that I can do or you can do or we can do. When Jesus says it's finished, it's not finished. When Jesus gives up his spirit, it isn't over. When Jesus' body is placed in the tomb, the story still continues because God is at work in the dead, dark places of our lives. God is at work in all of the places where I have nothing left to give, where you have nothing left to give. God is at work healing and redeeming and raising life out of death. And so as we come to our worship today, we are invited to lay down those problems that we can't solve. What do you need to surrender before God today? What pain and hurt do you carry around that you don't want to carry around anymore? What problems do you have that you don't know how to solve? What dead, dark places in your life need God's new life? What do you need to relinquish at the foot of the cross? Together, let us come with honesty to our own limits to the end of all that we can't fix. And together, let us wait and watch for Sunday morning.